begin here with our uh, study of Daniel. We'll just keep slogging on through here. We've uh, the good news is, is you only got me for today, and then you're going to get a, a break of a couple of weeks with some real teachers that'll come up, and then they'll go over probably chapter six and seven. So that'll be that'll be a nice break for y'all. You can uh, you can relax then. And uh, in Daniel three, we kind of left off. We were talking about the these three courageous young men that are standing before this fiery furnace, <clears throat> and we were asking the question, you know, is is God able, right? Because that's what Nebuchadnezzar wanted to know. He wanted to know, is God able? And they said, God is able. The God we serve is able. But how about this? How about these questions? You think they're easy. Is the God of the universe, is the God that breathed the universe into existence with his very word, is that God able to deliver? And we say, well, that's a, it's a simple question. You know, like if you, even if you were a non-believer, hypothetically, if there were a God that had created the universe, is he able? You'd, you'd think that the answer is a simple yes. Let me tell you that it's more difficult than that. I'm going to give you a story. Probably some of you have heard this. That's a sign of old age. You keep telling the same stories over and over. You just change the details a little bit. But my roommate, when I first went into the Air Force, was a great young man named Mike Morris. And he and I roomed together in what we called flight screening program, which meant they're not going to spend any money on you unless if they find out you can't fly or you get sick in the airplane or whatever. So that's all they did is they sent us out to Hondo, Texas in the middle of nowhere, and you'd fly these little bug smashers around in the, in the heat of the summer and bounce around. And then you had to pass that course before they'd even send you to officer training school. Mike and I were roommates, which was unfair to me because I, uh, you know, I barely got through school, you know, needed all the help I could get. Mike, on the other hand, was an astrophysicist, you know, major from MIT. That's right. <laughs> That's the way I felt like. You got to be kidding me. So Mike just, I mean, his mind out of this world. But, you know, the thing that really angered me was... How dare, you know, that God would give him all the talent, not only in mind, but in body and athletic ability. You see, Mike, his, his father was black, his mother was white from Germany, and Mike was about 6'2". There's nothing he couldn't do. Like, when he went into a test, he would memorize the test in about 10 minutes. He could figure out any aerodynamic problem we had. And of course, I had them all, and I was always going to Mike. But then when we went to the basketball court, he would drag us up and down the basketball court and jam at will. Then we went out to play mush ball. You ever played mush ball where they make the ball really big and heavy so that it stays in the playing field and that we don't have, you know, athletes hitting it out of the park and everybody has to play and all that? Well, I had played college baseball. I thought, well, certainly I could hit, but I knew I couldn't hit the mush ball out of the park, so you just had to go for base hits or whatever. Mike would step up there and drive it out of the park. He said he used to play this game with his dad where his dad would take him to the golf course and he would sit out there on the golf course and his dad would start betting with his other friends. He'd say, my caddy over here can outdrive you guys. And then Mike was the caddy. And he would step up in the middle of the course and then he would grab anybody's driver and drive the golf ball 300 plus yards with a nice little draw right in the middle of the fairway. So I thought, how unfair is that, Mike? But anyway, Mike was such a super guy uh, he went on to fly F-111s. He went to uh, pilot training with me at Willie, but he was a Bible reader. And every night I would pull out my New Testament, I'd start reading. So Mike said, you know what, I'm going to start reading as well. So at night we would read. And of course, the lights out were supposed to be about 1030 or something, but we would stay up with our flashlights. We'd get into all these long Bible discussions. Now, Mike, being the astrophysicist that he was from MIT, he would say, well, the, the, we know that the, the world is, you know, this universe is probably billions of years old. I said, well, Mike, how do we know that? And he says, well, we know, you know, there's stars that we're looking at that are 100 million light years away. And I said, well, what does that tell you? He says, well, it tells me that it's at least 100 million years, you know, ago that that star started shining. And so I said, well, Mike, I'd, turn my, I'd take my flashlight, and I said, now, Mike, you agree with me that God created the star, created the light? He said, yes. And I said, and, and then God was able to turn it on? He said, yes. I said, so now you're measuring the length of that beam and the speed of light, and you're coming up with these calculations. I said, but you know, if that God is 
that powerful and able to create it all, could not he have done this? And I would pull my flashlight out from under the blanket and go like that. And I'd say, you see what I did? It's not, I didn't turn it on. I just put it out in space. I said, in other words, when Adam looked at God, Adam could have said the same thing. The speed of light is this. And God would say, yes. He goes, and that star is 100 million light years away. And God would say, yes. And he'd say, then God, uh, you created that star 100 million years ago. And he'd say, no, I created it on day four, two days ago. In other words, is the God of the universe able? And what I would tell Mike is I would say, yes, he's able. Why are you putting God in some kind of constraint he who created the entire universe now has to obey the very laws of physics that he made and wrote. Because that's what Mike believed in. He said, well, these are the laws of physics. I said, and who wrote those equations? And did they come before the universe so that God was beholding to the very laws that he wrote? But that's the way people think. So when I ask you a simple question of, is the God of the universe able? It's not that simple of an answer for a lot of people. The second one is, of course, is the God we serve, Abel. Is the God we serve, you and I, Abel, to do the things that we read about in the, in the Bible? Is he able to deliver you from the angst of your life? Is he able to deliver you from the angst of the things that your children have been involved in or, uh, you know, a husband that's been incarcerated or, or these things, the problems that we have or the drug addictions that come our way and all the things that just, you know, beat us down into the ground? Is the God that we serve able? Are we still serving a God that, w that is not able? Ourselves or, or somebody else or, you know, uh, governing authorities or or in the medical community. Somebody's going to deliver me from this. But is the God that I serve able? And then the real question is about the God of the universe that's able, who Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego certainly proved to us that he could. And the question is, are you able to serve that God? Because what we're going to find out later on is that God doesn't want your lip service He's going to tell pagan kings, he's going to say, I don't care about what, you know, you, you haven't dedicated yourself to me. No, he's not going to say that. He's going to say, you, you know, you haven't done these things and sacrificed to me and you haven't come in every day and prayed and you haven't done. No, he's going to say, you knowing me didn't glorify me. I just flew with somebody that sat there and wanted to talk about how she wanted to raise her family with these moral principles and all of these things, but she didn't want to have anything to do with religion. She had nothing to do with God. She just wanted all the good capital that comes from good religious people in the Bible. She was a good person. She was a very good person. But that's not good enough because of who God is. It's not good enough to be a good person. God says that's not going to get you anywhere because of who he is. It's glorifying God. And that's what Job is about. It's not about suffering. Oh, by the way, he doesn't tell you how to suffer. He suffered through the worst and he can't give you one help with it other than to say that anywhere in there, you're going to continue to serve the God of the universe because of who he is. And we'll find out later that who are you, me, as nothing compared to God, that we can't question him. That's the God that we are asking, are we able to serve? God used a miracle that day, a miraculous delivery. If you think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they probably did not, did, you know, until Daniel had a dream given to him, would, would these three young men have grown up in a miraculous age? The answer is no. The miraculous age of the Old Testament, certainly. But in their lifetime, what did they see? Nothing but paganism, idolatry, and syncretism in the, in the gods of Israel and the kings of Israel and the people and the priests and all of this apostasy that had happened. That's what they grew up with. They didn't grow up watching miracles. Not one until Daniel. And that was an interpretation of a dream. The very 
in, 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 in very few years, they're in a situation where they're faced with this furnace. And they're saying, you know, our God is able. And of course, were they thinking of a miraculous delivery? I don't know. We take it for granted they were. Why do we do that? Because that's how it turned out. Did they know the end of the script? Were they told by God, oh, don't worry about this? No, they said, but if it be so. But if not, but if not, we're just not bowing down. And so they end up going into the fiery furnace. And there's this miraculous delivery, and there's the fourth person as a son of the gods that would be walking around, and Nebuchadnezzar gets his attention. And so he calls him out of that furnace. But let me ask you this. Did God need a miracle to deliver them? If I was standing in front of that fiery furnace, I would have been thinking I was a goner. And I would have been thinking we're out of the miraculous age, so I don't know that God can or will. How feeble is that? I'll tell you another story. In World War I, when the Germans overran our lines at the Somme, and the American soldiers started pulling back, and many of them were already wounded, and they had been, you know, mustard gassed, and, and all of these things, they had been shot with machine guns. They got caught in the barbed wire and the razor wire trying to get away. And as the Germans came through, they looked, and they wanted to pursue the army. They had just routed, but you had all these wounded people. What do you do with these wounded people stuck in the wire? You're not going to stop and take care of them. And you're certainly not going to go by and let them live because you may end up having to fight them later or you get to take, start sh you know, taking shots in the back. So they took their bayonets and there was an officer standing there and started pointing them out and saying, we need to get rid of these. Let's just eliminate them and go on. That's as fast as we could go. So they started shooting all the wounded, bayonetting them. This one individual's laying there. He watches this. What would you think if you watched everybody down the line getting bayoneted and you were coming up to be next? He heard the officer say in a Frankfurt accent something to the soldier of go ahead and kill this one, kill that one, this guy over here just to make sure. And when he heard that, this young American had grown up in Frankfurt. And so he said with a perfect Frankfurt accent, he says, where are you from? The German officer startled that he spoke German, and he said, I'm from Frankfurt. And then he said, don't you wish you were there now? And the German officer stopped. And he made that connection. And he saw these people as people different than he had just five minutes earlier. So he tells all of his soldiers, stop. Don't kill anymore. We'll do what we can. If we have to even leave him, we will, but we're not going to ban at him. That man's life was saved, and he went on to write a book and told about that story. Did he need a miracle to be saved and delivered? I mean, I don't know that God had anything to do with it, but that's the thing about providence, right? That's what we said about providence is that it is defined by the word perhaps. We don't know. But if God did have a hand in that, and that man was delivered, I could guarantee you he probably thought, I'm going to need a miracle to get through this. But he didn't, did he? And he was still delivered, and God could work in all kinds of ways. So when we say, well, he doesn't, he doesn't perform miracles today, that's putting him in a box. No, 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 you're putting him in a box to think that he needs a miracle to do what he wants done and to bring about in this world and put his people where he wants his people. I'm sure Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't think it was a miraculous thing that they were taken over, taken hostages, and, and been selected out of all the young men of Israel to be dragged off to a palace to be castrated or something. They probably didn't see that as a miracle or the hand of God at all. But he put them right where he wanted them or where he could use. And of course, if they would have backed down and didn't have the faith, then he would have had to move on to somebody else. But they were the only ones he had. And their faith was amazing. What if God chooses not to deliver us? I've said this before, but it's, this, is the, this is the question of faith, that we don't serve God 
because we want to be delivered and we think he's the only one that can do that. We're going to serve God regardless of the storm. As the saying goes, we'll praise him in the storm and glorify him regardless of the conditions in our life. And Revelation 2 and 10 and 11 is a perfect example of that. Fear not about the persecution that thou art about to suffer. Fear not about the things that thou art about to suffer. Why? Because it's going to be ugly. For the devil is about to cast some of you into prison, that you all may be tried is the language. Some of you are going to jail, but all of you are going to be under trial because those are going to be your loved ones in prison. You're not going to feel too good about that, are you? So we're all in trial. And you shall, not maybe, you shall have tribulation, persecution, 10 days. And we talked about that before. What's the 10? It means it's complete. Then he says, what you don't want to hear, be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. Why? Because you're going to die. Because you're going to die for me. I'm not going to deliver you. But be thou faithful unto death. He that hath an ear, let, the, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. He that overcomes, remember the word is to conquer. He that conquers will not be heard by the second death. Why not by the first? Because the first is going to get you. But it's the second death that matters. And I give you eternal life. Now, Nebuchadnezzar sees this going on. And says, you know what? Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's quite the admission for a pagan king. And that nobody would coerce them and to make them worship any other God but their own God. And that I'm going to make a decree that no one speaks against their God. So first he had a dream interpreted to him. His magicians couldn't do it, his enchanters couldn't do it, his soothsayers couldn't do it, the Chaldeans couldn't do it, all the wisdom in Babylon couldn't do it, but Daniel, this young man, could. And he said, it's not me, but it's my God. And then he goes on to see, and he says, well, who can deliver you from my hand? And that is just perfect. This is why you know these things aren't made up, because you know this falls in line with human nature, the nature of man, that when you get so powerful and you get to be king and you get to be an emperor and you get to be a dictator and you're at the top of your game, there is nothing that could pull anything out of your hand because you own it all. That's the heart of man. That's why our founding father said, we can't do that. We need a system to constrain man because they were Bible students. And they knew the nature of man. They weren't going to trust someone in government to do things because they knew what happens. People just accumulate power at your expense. And Nebuchadnezzar's asking about, because he knows his hand is that strong, even after seeing the dream. Now he has seen this kind of delivery, a miraculous delivery. And notice, he still is not going to understand he still is going to be mixing a little bit of Israelite theology with the pagan gods that he has. You can think of Jeroboam. You can think of Ahab. Does it ever work out very well? When the Jews were sent down into Alexandria on maybe some of the first kind of mission-type trips that Israel ever had, they went down there and they didn't do so well because after being exposed to all the knowledge in Alexandria, they started bringing in all of these other things into the temple that they had built for themselves. And then they just watered down the religion of the Old Testament to a point where you wouldn't have recognized it, and that is the nature of man. Then we go to turn to chapter 4. And when we turn to chapter 4, here is an admission, and probably maybe something like 35 to 40 years have passed. Because that's it. He, he, he's on the throne for like 43 years. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar, he's a long reigning king. And God set up Babylon, he set up Nebuchadnezzar, and he kept him there for a long time and probably for, for a lot of reasons. But near the end of his reign, somewhere in there, he makes this declaration. And I love the way this is written, because when you turn to chapter 4, you left off in chapter 3 with a pagan king saying, nobody says anything about the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and don't make them bow down to any of the other gods, meaning our gods. But when we get to chapter 4, which prophet in the Old Testament does he sound like? 
which prophet didn't sound like this. If you think he wasn't converted, you would have a hard argument to make. This man right here is calling God the Most High God. How great are his signs, how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. And then you have to ask the obvious question. What in the world happened to Nebuchadnezzar? He had already seen all of these other things. But the question is asked, what does it take to convert a man's heart? Sometimes more than we think. An interesting thing here is a side note of history. When you come to the point in 2 Kings 25 when evil Merodach, which by the way, Merodach is a take off of Murdoch, the, the god that they served in Babylon. It doesn't mean evil as in like he's Dr. Evil or he's, you know, evil this. It, that word evil is, has nothing to do with our word evil, although this evil Merodach was not a great king. But why is it that when he takes the throne as the son of Nebuchadnezzar, he immediately reaches down into prison and, and grabs Jehoiachin, who's been there for 37 years? And as soon as he goes to the throne, he pulls him up, brings him to his table, and says, feed him. That's one of the oddest things that happens in history, particularly in the Bible. And you would have to think it has a lot to do with his father and something that happened. What does it take for man to be converted? He has this dream. And again, Daniel is the only one that's able to come in and tell him the dream. And he's tried all of these other people. And we find out from the queen later on that Daniel's just not the chief of the magicians. He's chief of the Chaldeans. He's chief of the soothsayers. He's chief of the enchanters. He's, he was number one. And somehow God sets this up that Daniel again walks into a scene room where he's the last and all the others. But you notice the dialogue is very different. It's not tell me the dream and interpret the dream or you're all going to be burned and your houses be made a dunghill. That doesn't happen. They don't come in and try to, to, you know, wring their hands and say, well, you know what, let's try this on the king and tell him this is what it means. They don't even attempt that. Probably because they know who's waiting in the wings and who's coming in. And when Daniel comes in, people listen. And so he tells him about this dream, about this great tree that grows up into the heavens and goes all the way out to the ends of the earth. And all the, the birds of the heavens are in the tree. And you have all these animals that seek shelter under the tree. And it has, uh, you know, plentiful fruit. And all the inhabitants of the earth are fed by this fruit. It all seems to be going great until the watchers come down the holy ones, and they say, cut it down. Prune off all the branches, scatter the fruit, scatter the leaves, get the animals out from under this tree, but leave the root with a band of iron and a band of brass. When Daniel's done telling them the dream, you could tell Daniel has a soft spot in his heart for Nebuchadnezzar. You can tell he's troubled. He doesn't quite want to come up and tell Nebuchadnezzar exactly what it means. And, and he's having a hard time, but he's like, this is for those that hate you. This is according to those that would want you down because he tells him, you know, you're the tree. And Nebuchadnezzar had already seen that it was by, by the demand of the watchers, the decree of the watchers and the word of the holy one till the living knows that the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men, that the Most High ruleth over the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. And he sets up over it the lowest of kings. That's one of our themes of Daniel, isn't it? That God is in control. But to do this, he's going to take Nebuchadnezzar and he's going to change his heart and give him the heart of a beast. Let's think about this for a second. The heart of a beast instead of a man. When we read these passages, the fear of Jehovah is the beginning of wisdom. I've told you before that I thought maybe that was spiritual wisdom, biblical wisdom. The fear of Jehovah is the beginning of knowledge. I thought maybe that was biblical knowledge, spiritual knowledge. But the foolish despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of Jehovah is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding, maybe in spiritual matters. 
I think I'm very wrong. I think when people divorce themselves from God and take God out of the picture, they absolutely become irrational and they have to stay irrational to keep their worldview. Let me give you an example. When I went to space school out in California, they talked about a communication system there that was so complicated I hardly could hang on to the whole material. But it was about taking a communication set and encrypting and, and encoding all this information and then sending it thousands of miles up into space to the satellite. The satellite would know out of all the other things it's bombarded with, that's my package right there. None of the others, just that one. Then it's going to grab that package, but it can't read it because it's encoded. So it brings in the decoder ring, you know, and so it decodes it. Then it takes that information, and because that information is in the same language as the satellite, it reads that information, and it makes a burn, it makes a tor turn, it does something with its systems. And then it encodes information to say, this is what I've done. And then it encodes that and sends it back to the station on Earth. And when Earth station receives it, it says, that's my package. Out of all the packages I'm getting bombarded with, that's mine. And then it unpacks it, and then it says, well, I need to decode it. And so it decodes it with a preconceived information system, and then it's able to read that information. Nobody in this universe would think you could have people speaking different languages with different ideas make all the different components and go, boy, I hope this works out. In other words, information has to be, it's an agreed upon script. It's a, it's, a, it's a language that both sides need to understand. And when you and your friend got a decoder ring out of the cereal box, you knew you both had to have the same decoder ring or the thing wouldn't make any sense. Now, did I just explain to you the satellite system or did I just explain to you DNA? That's right. That's exactly what happens in the human body every day in this cell. So when James Watson, Francis Crick, in 1953, discovered this, when they were looking at this information, now James Crick, or Francis Crick particularly, is an atheist, big skeptic, big Darwinist. And this blew him away so badly, he had to change and alter something about his worldview. So he changed that worldview to say, you know what? There's no way this information could have just come over a period of time. Given time, there's not enough miracle for this to happen. Information comes from higher intelligence, and it's an agreed upon system. So he said, we have other life higher intelligence out there somewhere that has brought information and planted it here on Earth to jumpstart all of this evolutionary process. Now, he may have had an IQ a lot higher than mine, I'm sure, but that's the most imbecilic thing I've ever heard. That when you get to the point where the evidence is so clear that he now says, well, there's an intelligent source out there, much higher than ours, that in the past just must have come to Earth and planted this information. So remember when Richard Dawkins was getting interviewed by Ben Stein, and he was asked about this thing, and Richard Dawkins, the leading atheist of the world, said, yes, I think that's a possibility. But then he turned around and said, but we know that whatever intelligence is out there, that it had to have evolved. What kind of scientific statement is that when you know nothing of the kind? But they, need, they needed a higher intelligence source to be planted. So what I tell you is the fear of God is the beginning of all wisdom and knowledge. And to keep your rational mind, because without God, we cannot live. The heart of a beast, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. We're talking about the heart of a beast and mankind throughout the ages, not just Nebuchadnezzar in the field. All ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hinder the truth in unrighteousness because that which is manifest of God is known unto them because God manifested himself unto them for the invisible things of 
creation are clearly seen. Since the beginning of time, being perceived of the things that he made, even his everlasting power and divinity, that they may be without excuse. Therefore, knowing God, they glorified him not as God, neither gave thanks, but came vain in their reasoning, and their senseless heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God for the likeness of an image of corruptible man, birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Therefore, there in verse 28, in verse 28 says, God gave them up to reprobate mind, even as they refused to have God in their knowledge. God gave them up, gave them over to a reprobate mind. Has nothing to do with IQ, but everything to do with a worldview and irrationality, to do those things which are not fitting and being filled with unrighteousness. What does that look like? What does that look like? A small child taken in state custody because she has cigarette burns all over her body that date back for three or four years because mama's boyfriend wanted to discipline her. A small baby going to an emergency room where they see scalding third degree and second degree burns of of history because somebody wanted to get the baby to learn to be quiet. 13-year-old girls taken off of a bus by a bus driver to be locked in his basement for several years, even just blocks from their home. The sex trafficking in persons, the, uh, the, the molestation, priests that are held in trust, portraying themselves in a religious position to to abused several hundred boys, most of which would commit suicide, and the ones that survived fighting the degradation of sexual perversion. A man could have a beast heart. A 13-year-old girl that weighs about 200 pounds to throw another one down that weighs half her size and take her head and dribble it off the concrete and continue smashing it until she goes into convulsions and then crows about her victory and steps over the body as this girl is convulsing, and you hear the guttural sounds coming out of her that are of anguish, unintelligible. Nebuchadnezzar is not the only one that's had a heart of a beast. But Satan, with his lies, can hand out many hearts. When do people seek God? Jehovah's nine to them that are of a broken heart and can save such are of a contrite spirit. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. I've known Christians that have prayed that their children would hit rock bottom because of the lifestyle they live. You know how hard that is? I don't. I just know it's almost unimaginable pain to think that you're praying for your loved ones to hit rock bottom so bad because otherwise they'll be lost. In Isaiah 57, he says, I dwell in the high and the holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit. In Isaiah 66, but to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and that trembleth at my word. And then, of course, in James, he tells us that God gives grace, resists the proud, grace to the humble. And then the song that we sing, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, he shall lift you up. Daniel 10 and 12. I love this passage. I love this verse. In fact, I think I'm going to add it to the final at the end of the quarter. So write it down. This one is amazing to me. He says to Daniel, he says, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day, from the first day that thou set thy heart to understand and to humble thyself before thy God, thy words were heard. You know, I talk to people all the time that talk about praying or asking God for things or questioning God when things happen in their lives. 
But the real question is, it's amazing to me that you can go through your life kind of giving God short shrift and not really worrying about dedicating your life to glorifying Him, but then when things happen, you begin to question and say, well, I've prayed to God. That's not good enough. That's the whole thing about religion. And man just seems to think, well, I believe in God. That's okay for me, when, it, it, as if it's a choice. But we're going to find out later on in chapter 5 that Belshazzar, he's going to be getting all over him, and he's saying, because you didn't glorify me because of who God is, that he deserves that for our very existence here is dependent upon that. And he has our breath in his very hand. And here's a young man that has been taken away. You can imagine that he's thought that God is nowhere to be seen. But he fought all of that doubt off. He fought all of that fear off. And he sets his heart to understand. And he humbles himself before his God. And when that happened, his words were heard. Just like Cornelius wasn't saved, but his words were heard because he had humbled himself before God and he was searching for the the right things. In Daniel chapter 4, we read this. When he said, The sentence is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones, to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. And he sets up over it the lowest of men. God is in control. He's ruler over time, history, and life. But what does this mean? In other words, and we can read later on in chapter 4, he's even talking about the inhabitants of the earth. Control of every individual. What does that mean? I've heard from young preachers around here coming out of Faulkner that, well, this means that, uh, you know, we ought not to be concerned with anything because it's all under God's control. That's an interesting statement. You know, he says he knows every sparrow that falls to the ground. He says to pray for your daily bread. But if you get up and go to work, does that mean you have no faith that he's going to give you your daily bread? What does he expect you to do? He expects you to pray and then get up and go to work. He expects you to do the things in this life that you're put here to do, and there's tasks and things that we go through, even though God is in control. But you have freedom of choice. We've already established that with a plan of salvation. But in your life, it's the same way. There's consequences to your actions. There's consequences in your family to your life. There's consequences for society. There's consequences when somebody's driving down the road and gets caught in a crossfire. There's consequences. It's not all set up by God to say, no, these are the things that I'm going to make happen. In Romans 13, when he says, you know, the, the powers that be are ordained of God. So I've been told, hey, you shouldn't be concerned with anybody in power or whatever's happening because it's all appointed and ordained by God. You know, the same word is used in Acts 13 and 48 when he said the Gentiles rejoice because those that were ordained unto eternal life believed. Are you going to make the same argument? that they were appointed by God as individuals unto eternal life? I think we're beyond that, aren't we? What does that mean? It means intended and purposed. There's an intention and there's a purpose of God in this world, but there are consequences to the choices of man. And in God's providence, we don't know the individuals or whether he had a hand in it or just allowed the consequences to the beastly heart to take over a society and a community. If you were standing there on the eve of 1917 before the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, and you were as disgruntled as anybody about the czar, but because you're a Bible reader and a student of the Bible and you understood that the tyranny that's about to come down is dark and demi demonic, you would probably have no idea that over 100 million people are about to die under communism to free man from the shackles of, of these different systems and institutions. But you would know a dark foreboding on the horizon that man was about to lose his freedom. And with losing individual freedom, what have you all always lost in history? Freedom of religion in every case. 
would you have stepped up to say anything or would you have stood back and told those believers there in Russia, don't worry, God's got all this under control. He may have, but he'll still ask the question. If you saw somebody fall down in the street out here on Atlanta Highway, are you going to stop and try to help them maybe and get them out of the road? God's in control. But he uses people. And he uses people that are wise in the ways of the world because you're Bible readers. Not everything is set up on autopilot. We're not deists. We believe in freedom of choice and the consequences of man's actions. And Christians, out of anybody, should have a brighter light in the community and the culture around us than other people because we have an understanding of the heart of man without God. What is the nature of man? What is the nature of man? In 2 Chronicles 26 and 4, this would be a great test for young people, wouldn't it? People that really haven't read the Bible a whole lot but think they know something about it, and you'd say, okay, you tell me what's happening next. Sometimes I'd ask the question, who is this? But this is, this is kind of a giveaway because I'm telling you his father's Amaziah. You know Zechariah was the prophet at the time. It starts narrowing it down for people like Bob. But for the rest of us, we look at that and we go, look at this. As long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. And he made in Jerusalem engines invented by cunning men to be in towers and upon the bulwarks to shoot arrows and great stones. You can think of the Middle Ages with big catapults. Long before the Middle Ages, this is going on in the Middle East and in Palestine. And he said his name spread far abroad, for he was marvelously helped until he was strong. And you could ask young people, what comes next? Do you really understand the nature of man and what the Bible is trying to teach you? What comes next? But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up. That's not a shocker, is it? That's not a shocker. His heart was lifted up to his destruction. Even the great Hezekiah, who was maybe the greatest king in the Old Testament besides David, but probably had uh, more things said about his righteousness than any other king. At one point, his heart was lifted up and he turned from God and had to be broken back down to his knees. And we're going to find that out with the pagan kings as well. I always stop and try to think. I'd hate for God to have to think that he has to break me down to my knees. That unlike Daniel, I wouldn't be willing to step down and humble myself before my God and to set my heart on understanding his will and his way for us. The lessons of Daniel are absolutely incredible and they're going to continue on through time as long as man is on this earth because it describes our nature to a T and the relationship that God's people need to have with God. Thanks so much for your kind attention.